Hi, I'm Professor Steve Rowe. I'm a real paleontologist and you're watching Real Paleontology. And today I'm going to talk about sabretooths. Now, if you're a regular visitor to my little channel, you will know that I've talked about sabretooths before. Seven times, in fact, I've highlighted a particular species from the bizarre pouched Thylacosmilus to Smilodon and the crazy shark tooth giant Xenosmilus here. So, okay, maybe I am a bit obsessed with sabre tooths, but clearly I'm not the only one because yet another piece of sabre tooth research has just hit the news. This paper here, Functional Optimality, underpins the repeated evolution of the extreme sabre tooth morphology. This work includes some really neat actual physical testing of different sabre teeth 3D printed into stainless steel. So here I'm going to break down this and some other recent research in order to answer some broader questions. What does it mean to be a sabre tooth? Why would you want to be one? And why the hell aren't there any of these awesome predators around today? And we'll begin by trying to define what a sabre tooth actually is. Well, that's bloody obvious, Steve, you say. It's an animal with sabre teeth, and you'd be right. But it's also much more than that. Sabre tooths typically don't just have a set of particularly big sabre teeth. They come with a suite of other features. It's a total holistic design package that has been reinvented time and time again over the last 270 million years or so. In fact, sabre tooths have independently evolved four times within different mammal families in just the last 40 million years or so. There are around 130 known mammalian sabre tooth species. Now, the four families we're talking about are the pouch thylacosmilids, among which Thylacosmilus is the best known, the oxhyenids, including Machairoides here, Nimravids, sometimes called false sabre tooths, such as Hoplophonius, the Barbarophilids, like Barbarophilus, and of course, sabre tooth cats of the family Felidae, which includes beasts like Smilodon homotherium and Xenosmilus. This repeated, independent, re evolving of animals with very similar body plans is what we call convergent evolution, where similar features evolve in unrelated lineages to produce species that look the same and share broadly similar lifestyles. Classic examples of this are dolphins and ichthyosaurs or thylacines and wolves. Interestingly, in this paper by Melchonia and others, including myself, we found that convergence was way more extreme in sabre tooths than in any other mammalian carnivore group. Or at least this applies when we compare the larger, more specialised sabre tooths within each family. However, if you take a broader sweep to include the less extreme sabre tooths, as shown by Chatter Hotel 2024 here, convergence is far less obvious. This suggests that among the 130 species or so of mammalian sabre tooth, perhaps unsurprisingly, there was a wider range of predatory behaviours than many people had previously thought. And in each of these sabre tooth families, we find far less extreme varieties, especially among the smaller species, such as the Nimravid dinictus here. Anyway, obviously the sabre tooth design package has something going for it, or it wouldn't keep evolving over and over and over again. In fact, until pretty recently, it was all the rage. Two million years ago, you could have found sabre tooths on every continent except Australia and Antarctica. On the other hand, you might also just have noticed that there aren't any sabre tooths around today, not a single one. And aside from the fact that this is a crying shame, it strongly suggests that being a sabre tooth isn't all beer and skittles. As demonstrated by Chatar and friends in 2024, the emergence of a basic sabre tooth plan seems to be followed by spasms of rapid evolution, followed by the evolution of larger and more extreme versions, which is then followed by decline and ultimate extinction. So, what the hell's going on here? Well, of course, sabre teeth like this one aren't just longer than your average canine. They are a very different shape. As you can see in this Smilodon canine here, it also has a flattened cross section as opposed to the conical canine tooth of this line. This means it theoretically should encounter less resistance as it's driven into the prey animal. 
You can also see that the leading edge is much sharper than the outside edge, meaning again that theoretically it would encounter far less resistance as it's pulled back through the flesh of the prey animal. Now, at least on paper, there should also be an advantage to the predator here because driving a long knife-like blade into the flesh of an animal and then ripping it backwards is going to result in far more destructive and damaging wounds than a bite with a shorter conical tooth. So it figures that the longer, flatter and sharper the tooth, the more destructive it will be. Now, what we have found is that within each of these saber tooth lineages, the larger species, which tend to have the larger, more extreme saber teeth, like Smilodon or Tholocosmilus here, also tend to share a range of other specialized features. Pretty obvious one is that they have really wide gapes, not much point in having big long teeth if you can't open your mouth wide enough to use them. But then there are many other common features. They have weaker jaw closing muscles, but longer, more powerful necks. Other common traits include particularly powerful but flexible forelimbs, relatively short lower backs and short hind limbs too. The general consensus among wee boffins is that the longer neck allows the predator to more accurately position the big canines, the more powerful muscles in the neck allow it to drive the canines in without the need for big jaw closing muscles and the remaining features give it extra stability and strength. Once you put this whole package together, you have a truly lethal kit, beautifully optimized for killing relatively big animals and killing them quick. Now, as I suggested earlier, it's pretty much certain that there was variation in the killing technique of different saber tooth species, especially among the smaller ones with less extreme saber teeth. But the likely common theme for the bigger, more specialized species was that they used their great strength and stability to wrestle their prey to the ground and immobilize them before deploying those deadly teeth, most likely driving them into the neck of the prey and then pulling back, severing major blood vessels and or the windpipe. But what's the big deal, you might ask? Obviously, big cats today are perfectly able to kill big prey without these specializations. Well, the big advantage that the saber tooth probably has is that once it's applied this deadly bite, or perhaps several bites, it can stand back and sit it out. At this point, the prey is doomed. It's going to die, and it's going to die quickly. The canines of a big conical tooth cat, like a lion or tiger, might look scary to us, but in reality, they usually do little damage to a big herbivore like a zebra or cape buffalo. The lion or tiger really only has one option, death through suffocation, by either clamping its jaws around the muzzle or neck of the prey. And this can be a very long drawn out process, taking 10 minutes or more. That's a very long time to hang on to a ton of pissed off Cape Buffalo, for example. And it's not just the victim that the predator has to worry about. In the case of big herd animals, other members of the herd may well pile on to save their herd member. There are many recorded incidents of lions being badly damaged by enraged buffalo and sometimes killed. On top of that, the longer this struggle goes on for, the more likely it is that other unwanted guests will be drawn to the commotion, like other big predators of the same or different species. So yeah, you don't have to have big saber teeth to kill big prey, but it sure as hell helps. Even with all this specialised big game hunting kit, there's plenty of evidence in the fossil record suggesting that even big saber tooths commonly sustain serious damage in heavyweight bouts with big angry prey. As you can see in this figure here from a 2017 paper by Caitlin Brown and others, traumatic injuries were commonplace among specimens of Smilodon from the Labrea tar pits, particularly in the chest and lower back. Now, back to this very latest research published by Pollock et al. What I find really cool is that they didn't just build a bunch of computer models of saber teeth, although this was an important part of the study, they also built actual physical replicas of a bunch of them and tested their performance on a gelatinous material with very similar properties to flesh. 
Their overall objective here was to put hard numbers on the potential trade-offs between the capacity of longer, flatter, sharper canines to do more damage against the risks of these teeth breaking. Another objective was to see just how much more easily these sabre teeth could have been sunk into the flesh of their prey. In these experiments, using both computer simulated and actual physical models, they included the canines of living conical tooth predators, along with a wide range of canines from sabre tooths, including more and less extreme varieties. Since much of what they found really wasn't that surprising. They clearly demonstrated that longer, flatter, sharper canines required considerably less force in order to be driven into the flesh of their prey, and that they would have undoubtedly done more damage. The longer, flatter and sharper they were, the more damage they would have done, and the less force was required to drive them home. On the other hand, they clearly demonstrated that these increasingly extreme sabre tooth variants were also increasingly fragile and likely to break. But what's really important here is that they have actually quantified this. For example, it took up to 50% less force to drive the canines of an extreme sabre tooth like Thylacus malus into simulated flesh than your standard conical toothed canine. On the other hand, in bending simulations, the two most extreme sabre tooths showed twice as much stress as Smilodon and six times as much stress as the canines in a panda bear. This very clearly shows that these teeth were way more likely to break if driven into a hard, unforgiving material like bone. These results pretty much confirm that the bigger, more specialised sabre tooths with their particularly long, sharp canines, regardless of which family they belong to, must have directed their killing bites at fleshy parts of their prey. Biting into bone would have to have been a last resort. But a broader take home from this research is that although within each family that includes sabre tooths, there was a trend for species to become bigger and more specialized with increasingly large and dangerous looking canines, there was also clear evidence that many other less specialized species of sabre tooth existed with a range of different morphologies. This reinforces the view that there was a range of different predatory behaviours out there used by sabre-tooths and that the archetypal subdue and then take down the prey with a throat bite was not common to all species. Now, before I wind things up, if you like this video, please like and subscribe. It helps a lot. Now, lastly, Pollock and colleagues speculate on precisely why the sabre tooth morphology has repeatedly evolved, disappeared, and re evolved time and time again. Their results obviously suggest that long, sharp canines give a predator a strong functional advantage. The longer and sharper, the better. But if sabre teeth are so damn useful, then why are there no sabre tooths at all in the world today? The answer they give is one that a number of researchers in recent publications have also provided. They invoke a concept called the evolutionary ratchet. Basically, once a lineage has embarked on the saber-tooth journey, it kind of gets channeled into a spiral of increasingly extreme specialization. This includes modifications to the entire body and skull, not just the teeth. Each of these adaptations further optimizes the animal toward a very specific ecological role. And with each new specialization comes a trade-off. This evolutionary trajectory makes for species that are increasingly better adapted for taking larger but less agile prey. But once they start this trip, there's no going back. And if these large but less agile prey become too scarce, they have nowhere to go. Their terrifying teeth and massively muscular bodies so effective as big game kit are next to useless for smaller, more agile prey. Not because they could not kill it if they caught them, but because they can't catch them in the first place. It's a cruel irony that being the biggest, baddest kid on the block in some ways makes you the most vulnerable. 
Bottom line is that within the last 20,000 years or so, populations of the big lumbering prey that extreme sabre tooths were so superbly adapted to hunt have dwindled to the point that they could no longer sustain these big, super specialised predators. But if there's one thing that the sabre tooth story gives us, it's hope. This tried and true super predator design package has died many times before, but it always comes back. Unfortunately, I doubt that I'll be here to see it. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please like and subscribe. I'll be back in another week with another one.